Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, thank you very much. Your own intelligence community has assessed that the Afghan government will likely collapse. That is not true. Is it, can you please clarify what they have told you about whether that will happen or not? That is not true. They did not, they didn't, did not reach that conclusion. What is the level of confidence that they have that it will not collapse? The Afghan government and leadership has to come together. They clearly have the capacity to sustain the government in place. The question is, will they generate the kind of cohesion to do it? It's not a question of whether they have the capacity. They have the capacity. They have the forces. They have the equipment. The question is, will they do it? And I want to make clear what I made clear to Ghani, that we are not going to walk away and not sustain their ability to maintain that force. We are. We're going to also work to make sure we help them in terms of everything from food necessities and other things in, in, in the region. But, but there is not a conclusion that, in fact, they cannot defeat the Taliban. I believe the only way there's going to be — this is now Joe Biden, not the intelligence community — the only way there's ultimately going to be peace and security in Afghanistan is that they work out a modus vivendi with the Taliban, and they make a judgment as to how they can make peace. And the likelihood there's going to be one unified government in Afghanistan controlling the whole country is highly unlikely. Thank you. But we have talked to your own top general in Afghanistan, General Scott Miller. He told ABC News, the conditions are so concerning at this point that it could result in a civil war. So if Kabul falls to the Taliban, what will the United States do about it? Look, you've said two things. One, that if it could result in a civil war, that's different than the Taliban succeeding, number one. Number two, the question of what will be done is going to be implicated — is going to implicate the entire region as well. There's a number of countries that have a grave concern about what's going to happen in Afghanistan relative to their security. The question is, how much of a threat to the United States of America and to our allies is whatever results in terms of a government or an agreement? That's when that judgment will be made. Breaking news this morning out of Afghanistan. Sources say the U.S. Uh, is now completely pulling out all U.S. personnel from the U.S. Embassy in Kabul over the next 72 hours. That is different from what we heard on Thursday from the president, who said some uh, personnel would be pulled out. Yeah, right now, as the Taliban is closing in on Kabul, the evacuation of U.S. Embassy personnel is well underway. A U.S. official says the goal is to get them out by Tuesday, if not sooner. Right now, you're looking at video shot by CNN that appears to show U.S. helicopters flying above Kabul, possibly carrying U.S. personnel. CNN's Clarissa Ward is live in Kabul, Afghanistan. Uh, Clarissa, help us understand what's happening there, and good morning. Good morning, Christy. There's a lot of moving parts here. You mentioned the evacuations of U.S. Embassy personnel. I mean, we have just heard a nonstop stream of choppers all morning going back and forth from the embassy to the airport. We also saw an Apache gunship accompanying several Chinooks. That gives you a sense, I think, of just how tense things are here. And that's because the Taliban are now very much outside the gates of Kabul. Uh, we heard earlier a statement from Zabiullah Mujahid, who is the spokesperson for the Taliban. He said that they are not going to enter the city violently, that they want to enter peacefully. He urged people to stay at home, not to try to flee. He said that there would be a blanket amnesty, basically, for anyone who had worked with the government or with security forces, as long as they did not try to fight the Taliban. And we also are being led to believe that there are sort of ongoing last-minute talks between the Taliban, between uh, the go government of Ashraf Ghani, the Afghan president, to try to come up with some kind of an interim government, a sort of peaceful transferal of power. We heard from Afghanistan's defense minister, again, urging people to not panic, saying that the city of Kabul is still very much under control, that defenses are strong, and that negotiations are ongoing to come to a peaceful conclusion. But I can tell you, Christy, that that message 
is not being embraced on the streets of the Capitol. It has been incredibly chaotic here this morning with people just desperately trying to get out of the city. The streets have been choked with traffic, long lines outside the passport office. Everybody frantically worried about what will happen when Taliban fighters do enter the capital, as it appears may be happening in the coming hours or days, depending on how those talks go. We just don't know. Christy, Boris. Clarissa Ward, live for us there. You and the crew take good care there. Thank you so much, Clarissa. So we want to continue this conversation here. Um, the Taliban, as she said, at the gates of Kabul. Uh, in response to the rapid gains by the Taliban, President Biden, as we said, now authorized an additional 1,000 U.S. troops to assist with efforts. Bill Roggio is the managing editor of the Long War Journal. We're also joined by him and CNN military analyst Colonel Cedric Layton. Um, thank you both so much for being here. We appreciate it. Bill, I, I want to ask you, uh, first of all, um, when you hear what we are hearing from the Taliban spokesman this morning, that um, they want a peaceful and satisfactory transfer of power to be agreed upon, what do you expect satisfactory to be for them? Good morning and thank you. Uh, the, for the Taliban, the only thing the Taliban, it, it has always had a maximalist strategy or an objective here. And that is the reestablishment of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan with its leader as the emir. Um, the, the Taliban have used negotiations to, as a ruse, as a smokescreen. Um, we should never trust the Taliban when they're talking about peace. They do want peace. It's not our version of peace. It's the Taliban's version of peace. It's the peace of the Taliban, and it won't be peaceful for the Afghan people. The, the Taliban absolutely would rather take Kabul, would rather the Afghan government surrender and take control of Kabul, but it will, make no mistake, it will take Kabul by force if the government refuses to surrender. Um, there won't be power sharing, uh, there, anything like that. Don't expect it from the Taliban. Um, the, we, the people, the, our policymakers, our military commanders, intelligence officials, they've relied on this notion that the Taliban would compromise that it would accommodate an Afghan government, but that was never going to happen. And so if the Afghan government ha really has one cho two choices, surrender or flee the, flee the country. So Colonel Layton, what is the national security concern for the U.S. right now when we see the expediency by which the Taliban has moved through that country, 25 of their pro uh, provincial capitals, uh, are now in the hands of Taliban, and it's 25 out of just 34. Yeah, that's right, Christy. And I think the, the big national security implication here is how do we really organize our armed forces to deal with threats like al-Qaeda, like ISIS, like the Taliban, uh, when you are called on to go into a place like Afghanistan and uh, conduct military operations. Uh, you know, we were clearly very successful in 2001 in wake of 9-11, going in there and toppling the Taliban. Now the tables have turned. And now what we're seeing is really a, a wave of uh, Taliban victories because the partners that we had in Afghanistan uh, were not capable of not only unifying themselves, but of presenting a, an armed force that could challenge the Taliban. And that uh, is something that uh, we really need to take very seriously and understand uh, because the future implications of the Taliban victory are going to be very, very profound. Bill, you've called, and I'm quoting you, uh, what we're seeing today as the greatest intelligence failure in decades. You say the Taliban planned, prepared, organized, recruited, deployed fighters, all under the nose of the U.S. military, NATO, and Afghan intelligence. In this 20-year period, where did intelligence fail? Was it early on? Uh, did the Taliban see an opening, say, 10 years ago, and they started to reorganize? I mean, how did the U.S. miss this? Yeah, and I want to be very clear. I know individuals within the U.S. intelligence and military um, establishment who saw this, but this is a overall failure in leadership, both political, military, and intelligence <clears throat> at the top levels. They thought that um, they didn't. We didn't. We. They never understood the enemy. They pretended that the Taliban would disassociate with Al Qaeda. 
Um, they thought that the Taliban was a group that they could work with. So they ignored the Taliban's strategy, the Taliban's objectives. And by 2018, General Miller, who was the last commander of Afghan of U.S. forces in Afghanistan and NATO as well, he said, as as the Taliban was slowly seizing control of districts and implementing its rural insurgency strategy, where it would take rural districts and expand its control, he said he rejected the the security situation on the ground and said that negotiations with the Taliban is the only measure of success. The U.S. Mil US military leaders, intelligence leaders checked out on the Taliban. They thought they were going to get a deal on the table. They never believed that the Taliban was capable of overrunning cities. It has. It actually happened in that time period when General Miller made that statement. Everyone should have seen this coming. Um, I, if I was able to see this coming, I don't understand how the U.S. military and intelligence establishment, which has billions upon billions of dollars at its disposal, um, was not able to see this. This really is the greatest failure since Tet. And Colonel, what does that say about the lack of intelligence now that the U.S. will have in that country and, and how that affects the national security, not just of the U.S., but of, uh, of countries around it? Yeah, Christy, the, uh, this failure to understand that Bill so correctly points out is really at the heart of the matter. And when you look at the uh, technical aspect, I'll call it, of intelligence collection, the fact that we do not have a uh, really adequate collection resources covering Afghanistan makes the forces that are currently in Kabul uh, trying to protect uh, U.S. embassy personnel and uh, you know potentially Afghan uh, civilians uh, it makes them blind. Uh, and you know when you're blind and you're deaf and you can't uh, tell what's going on, you're at an incredible disadvantage both tactically and strategically. And that's the kind of thing that we're dealing with right now. In the future. This is going to be a huge issue because the Taliban can do many things even when we're watching them. They can really do a lot of stuff when we're not there watching them, at least not watching them in the way that we need to watch them with assets on the ground in an area that can actually collect information and analyze that information. So it's a failure of collection, it's a failure of analysis, and it's a failure of, of putting all of this together and uh, making meaningful uh, intelligence available to our policymakers and leaders. Bill Rocio and uh, Colonel Cedric Layton, you know, your expertise is, is something that we, we certainly value here. Thank you for your time today.